Teaching is of great importance in the College of Engineering at NC State University, and our faculty members are highly valued for both their teaching and research abilities. At the top echelon of those excellent teachers is Dr. Richard Felder, Herc Selney's Professor of Chemical Engineering. His list of national and regional awards for his work to promote excellence in engineering education is much too long to enumerate here. During his career, Dr. Felder has developed effective teaching methods by putting into practice theories from educational and cognitive psychology. The video you're about to watch demonstrates some of those methods. Thanks in part to the teaching workshops that Dr. Felder has presented on campuses all over the world, the instructional approach he has developed is now being applied by hundreds of his colleagues. The eventual effect on engineering education of his work could indeed be profound. Hi, I'm Rich Felder. In the course of what I do for a living these days, I often have occasion to get on various soapboxes and preach the gospel of active and cooperative learning. Active learning means students doing anything but sitting and listening to a lecture, watching and listening to me if I'm the lecturer. It means they're doing something, thinking about things. Cooperative learning means students working together in teams on some sort of a structured exercise, not just going off and doing something and handing it in, but taking individual responsibility for different pieces of it and also being held accountable for what they do and what everyone else does. Both of these approaches shift a lot of responsibility from the teacher to the students. And the students don't always welcome this shift with open arms, and some of them get downright hostile about it. But in the long run, they learn more. They learn at a deeper level. They acquire higher level thinking skills, critical thinking, creative thinking. And they develop better attitudes about the subject and more confidence in themselves. And this isn't just me talking. I can uh, offer a couple of hundred research studies that back up those claims. The question is, how do you do all that? It's not obvious. It's not the sort of thing that teachers are born knowing how to do, get students actively involved in their learning and get them working together in productive ways. What I want to do in this short videotape is give you some feeling for what the in-class process looks like, how you get students working in class, even in large classes, and how you get them working together. The basic procedures that we're going the to excerpts you're going to see now come to from a class that I teach on material and energy balances. It's the introductory chemical engineering course taken in the first semester of the sophomore year. This class was given about halfway through the semester, so the students already have quite a bit of experience working in active learning groups during classes. The first clip comes at the beginning of the period. I had just previewed what we were going to cover that day and passed out a copy of my lecture notes containing formulas, examples, and a number of questions and exercises for us to work through. In what you'll see now, I get them into groups, assign recorders, and give them something to read and discuss. If you're in groups of three, the one in the middle is going to be recorder for, this ex uh, for the series of exercises. And if there's four of you in the group, so there's two of you in the middle, uh, flip a coin or just decide on which one of you is going to be recorder and that one prepare to write. I'm just going to want one person writing in uh, the series of exercises that you're going to have three or four people talking. Okay, do that for me now. Just decide who's going to be a recorder. Recorders, get ready. <clears throat> okay, I want you to take something like uh, one minute and lean over, because you only have one of these things to read in your group. Glance over quickly the first page. It's stuff you've all seen before, but I want to make sure that we're, uh, we're on the same page, as it were. Quickly go through it, and if any of you have any questions about what's on that page, talk, to your, talk among yourselves and make sure you've got it. Quick read on this, just to convince yourself that you've seen it all before. Go. Notice that most of them get right into it, and one of them spots a mistake in the notes, which he calls me yes. on. Uh, for the delta U and delta H, should that be out, out, minus in, in? I'm sorry? Uh, the delta U and the delta H, should that be out, out, minus in, in? Um, let's see, um, wh where are you? Uh, right here. Uh, out, out, minus in, in, yep, that's a, that's a typo. For delta U and delta H, those subscripts on the second summary should be in. 
While they're working, I warn them that I'm going to call on someone for a response to an embedded question in the notes. And after a while, I stop them okay. and call on a student, um, and I repeat her answer to make sure that the whole class gets it. What do you think uh, units on a closed system energy balance equation? What does each one have? OK, joules or kilojoules, open system balance equation. What do you think? Joules per second. OK, right. joules per second or kilojoules per second. Joules per second is the same thing as watts, all right? Kilojoules per second, kilowatts, OK, so. I did two things in that little scene to help ensure that I was getting as much involvement from the students as possible. The first one was to call on individual students for a response rather than just asking a question and looking for volunteers. And the second was to alert them ahead of time that I was going to do that. If students know that I'm not going to single anyone out, then many of them just remain passive during these group exercises and sit there knowing that eventually somebody will provide the answer. But if they know that I could land on any of them for a response, it motivates them to get into the program and to do whatever they need to do to make sure that they're ready with something when I do call on people. In that example, I put the students to work individually at first, and then I had them get together in groups and synthesize a better answer. In the next example, I put the students directly to work in groups. All right, I'd like you in your group to quickly go through this, that little uh, series of lines called energy balance, and there's a couple of embedded questions in there. I'd like you to talk to each other, work through the energy balance equation, make sure you understand where each one comes for each term comes from, and answer the two questions that are embedded there. Why do we set delta EP equals zero? And why are we neglecting delta EK? All right, and make sure that you agree with the bottom line Q plus WS is four delta H hat. Go, talk to each other. This is a longer exercise now, so I can float into the class and interact with some of the groups, which is another way of keeping them on task. The key is to mix things up, vary the format, so they never know what you're gonna do next. That's what keeps this approach from getting stale and just as boring as nonstop lecturing. Um, approximately? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a continuous steady state process. You can't produce mass. Okay. Um, all right, so city. Okay, so M has to be the same and V has to be the same. Okay, now. Think about it. Right here, why do we neglect delta EP? All right, it's, it's not, uh, we're not feeding the ice in at the bottom of a building and taking the steam out at the top. No change in height, so no change in potential energy. All right, somebody, anybody, tell me why we're neglecting kinetic energy change. It's the same rate in and out. Got to be careful, all right? What's, what's kinetic energy? formula for it, 1 half mv squared, all right? So m has to be the same, but what else has to be the same? Velocity, is it? Uh, probably not. Ice coming in, very dense, compact. Steam coming out, it's expanded a lot. What would you expect as far as velocities go? You would expect a big change. So what then? Okay, what's going on in this process is a phase change. Between that clip and the next one, I lectured for about 10 minutes. A lot of people who come to my workshops get the idea sometimes that I'm dumping on lecturing, that I'm saying, don't lecture whatever you do, it's a bad technique. But that's not at all what I'm saying. What I'm saying is to balance the approach. Do some lecturing, some group work, some individual work, some individual work followed by group work. Uh, in my classes, I still lecture for over half the period in most of my class sessions, and sometimes more than that. The key, again, is to mix it up so that they never know what you're going to do next. That's what keeps the class interesting. This next clip comes about 30 minutes later. We've been at it in class now for over an hour. Watch their faces when the camera goes to them. How do you know it's not saturated? Um, because if you look in the superheated steam tables, you can look up 300 degrees C and 1.5 bars, and you'll see that you're in the superheated region. The saturated conditions are all the way on the left. The other thing, Jason, is I could look up 
300, I could look up 1.5 bars in the, in the uh, saturated steam table, all right? And I can find the temperature. What is it? Somebody get me, how much? 111.4. All right, 111.4 is the temperature corresponding to 1.5 bar saturated steam. This is 300, a lot more than 111.4, therefore the steam must be superheated. Could you see that they were awake and with me throughout that clip? Think of what most classes look like after even 20 minutes of straight lecturing, even if it's a good lecturer. What I think kept them with me throughout that class was the fact that they had something to do periodically and not just sit and watch me and listen to me. Okay, you saw five minutes out of a 75-minute class. Most of the rest of the 70 minutes were me in business as usual, lecturing, working out problem solutions, answering questions. I covered what I wanted to cover in that class, even with the active learning exercises, and over the course of the semester, I covered the entire syllabus, every bit that I had originally planned to cover. Contrary to most professors' fears when they first hear about these active learning methods, that if they do all of those exercises, they'll never get through the syllabus. But I covered the syllabus in a way that kept most of the students awake for the entire semester and with me. And in the course of their learning, they were learning both the material in the course and more importantly, I think, how to work together. They learned the same things in their homework, which was largely done in groups outside class, working in teams under conditions that assured individual accountability. In the end, they were learning a lot more than material and energy balances. They were learning how to rely on one another as resources rather than counting on me as the sole source of wisdom and knowledge. And in the end, I think that if we as instructors can teach our students how to do that, then we're really doing our jobs.